I'm talking about flower arranging in St Stephen's Church, Ambridge. I'm not talking about professional florists. There. There. Is that all right? I'm not talking about professional florists who come in to do wedding flowers. Um, I'm talking about, as Nicola has said, the people that do the flowers on a regular basis. This is a bit of a historic overview. I'm not talking about contemporary characters. I've gone back into the archives and looked at the history books. This is a poem from Philip Larkin. I step inside the church door. I step, I step inside, letting the door thud shut. Another church, matting seats, stone and little books, sprawling of flowers cut for Sunday, brownish now, some brass and stuff. He's describing a familiar scene. It's all like all the other churches. It has arrangements of flowers that sprawl. They're untidy. And other than the brownishness, there are no other colours mentioned. It might be familiar to Larkin, but one wonders who put those flowers there. Why? Why are they arranged like that? And are they coming back to get rid of the dead ones? Cutting and growing flowers have been used across different societies and points in history as commodities, ritual objects and symbols, as identified particularly by Jack Goody, the anthropologist, in his book Culture of Flowers. And human interaction with them has often been described in gendered terms. In Europe, flowers were used in pre-Christian worship and there were references to garlands, wreaths and cut flowers being used in Christian services in medieval churches. However, the practice of using cut flowers and floral imagery in churches became increasingly contentious following the Reformation and its rejection of Catholic medieval practices. The 19th century was a particularly confused period in attitudes to the use of cut flowers. Some Protestants regarded the flower as a reproductive organ and therefore as inappropriate to have in a place of worship. Others regarded flowers as tools of Catholicism designed to ensnare women into popish ways. In 1853, the church warden of St Paul's in Knightsbridge complained to the Bishop of London that his vicar was encouraging bouquets of flowers in the church. And he described them as foreign fripperies. The bishop ruled on the practice and said it could continue, but flowers should not be arranged in cross shapes and they should only be in bunches of one colour. A further ruling in 1858 of an Anglican handbook of ritual stated, unnatural twisting of flowers into festoons is to be avoided. Arrangements were to be restrained, formal and symmetrical. And flowers were to, quote, present a manly and disciplined use. <laughs> the fecund femininity of the female flower can and will be constrained by the masculinity of design. The natural world can be allowed into the church but only subject to very specific designs. These, these, this is an illustration from Edward Cutts' 1854 essay on decoration in churches. There's no sprawling, no frippery, just straight lines. And Cutts, in particular, who wrote at length about this, floral decorations or foliage decorations had to echo the architecture of the churches. Although... Um, as you can see in this piece, we well, might not be able to, the text at the bottom says, these two drawings show how temporary ecclesiastical decorations make a perfect background for the fashionable feminine costumes of the period. And you might be able to see a woman, bottom right, in a bustle, blending in. Implicit in Cut's writing is that women are the ones going to be doing the flowers, but their husbands and brothers are going to be the ones fixing them up. Fit the, um, you can see that these are um, arrangements of leaves that have been fixed to staves and fixed to the walls. We now jump to the middle and late 20th century and the Church of St Stephen's, which was established in 1281 in Ambridge. 
It's actually listed on the Church of England heritage record, 647001, if anyone's interested. It's a fairly typical English rural church and has few special characteristics. And I would say it's probably very much the type of church that Larkin was writing about. So who's doing the flowers? <laughs> Apparently, in 2008, a number of old flower rotor lists were found at the back of a cupboard in the vestry, and I think they were found by someone called Joanna Toy. They list the pairs of parishioners who were to do the flowers for each of the four Sundays for the following months. So we've got June 1955, August 1963, September 75, May 85, January 1996, September 2008. What they don't tell us is how the rotors might have changed or whether the same people did the same Sundays throughout the year. And we don't know who drew the rotor up, were they self-selected, did people choose to work with the people they were working with? I haven't been able to find any data about the Flower Festival, which took, part in, took place in 1981 to mark 700 year anniversary of the church. So if anyone has any information on that, I'd be very grateful to receive it. Um, I've tried to kind of categorise these. Um, if they appear more than once, they're in colour, and there's a kind of very rough familial relationship in colour. There are 29 individuals named over the period. Some appear over time, a number of times, but with different surnames. Only one woman is unmarried. Four were widows when they came to the village. Polly Perkins, Marjorie Antipas, Agatha Turvey and Laura Archer. But Peggy, Shula and Carol all become widows over the period. Both Shula and Carol remarry. And Carol actually appears with three different names, Carol Gray, Carol Grenville, and Carol Tregoran. And the remainder are all married women. Of the 29 women, 19 are either related to or married to landowners or business owners, own their own business, or as with Usha, are professionals, so we would call them middle class. Nine are working class, and one, Agatha Turvey, Agatha Turvey is indeterminate. The oldest is Doris Archer at 85 in 1975, and the youngest is Grace Archer at 25, June 1955, which of course was only a few short months before she died tragically in a fire. Jennifer Travers Macy, nay Archer, first appears aged 30, and Susan Carter appears in 1996 aged 33. They're both quite young for, at this point particularly compared to the other women. And some families have multi-generational engagement with the rota. You have Polly Perkins in 1955, then by 63 her daughter Peggy's on the rota, and then by 1975 Polly's granddaughter Jennifer is on the rota. Lillian does not appear. <laughs> Ever. So Peggy and Jennifer continue to appear on every rota except for January 1996. And of course, this was the point at which Peggy uh, resigned from the flower rota because of the female vicar. Jill Archer is the longest serving flower ranger and she arrives in August 63 at the age of 33, having married Phil Archer and with two small children. In January 1996, um, her daughter, Shula Hebden, is present. At this point, she is a widow, mother of a small child, and it's shortly before she has an affair with Dr. Locke. Sorry, slut shaming again. Um, so from this, we can extrapolate the following. Only women do flower arranging in Ambridge. It's a primarily middle-class undertaking. It's an activity that can be shared through the matrilineal line, but not always. I mean, another person who doesn't notably um, show up in this is Elizabeth. You could argue that joining the rota offers women some sort of societal acceptance and that it is, in fact, a normative, if not heteronormative, type of activity. Jennifer and Susan both join at very specific points in their lives. When Jennifer arrives, appears in 75, 
She's in the process of splitting up with her husband, Roger Travis, Travers Macy, before marrying Brian Aldridge the following year. She then does the flowers in 2008, which, as you will all remember, is just one year after the appearance of Rory Donovan. I would say that Jennifer has had an interesting life, but her place on the road to validate her within, within Ambridge. Susan Carter is only three years out of prison when she appears on the rota for helping her brother Clive Horobin. She's the first Horobin to arrive on the list, so given what we know about Susan's aspirations and doing the flowers may represent a step up in Ambridge society. However, this may not be borne out by the fact that her rota partner, unfortunately, is Betty Tucker, who of course was held hostage by Clive Horobin. <laughs> Did doing the flowers provide a space for Betty to forgive Susan? Usha Franks, who is Hindu rather than Christian, joins the rota in September 2008, having married the vicar that summer. Given the hostile response from some parishioners such as Shula towards the marriage, she needs to join the rota to establish herself both as the vicar's wife and as a functioning, if non-Christian, member of the church community. So you can join the rota once you're married, or if you've been widowed. Single women do not join the rota. There are no single women with the exception of Carol Gray in 1955, but as one of the more unconventional people within the village, you could say that she is an outlier and she uses the flower rota as a way of stabilising herself within the community. <coughs> Excuse me. Here we see, allegedly, Peggy, Carol and Nora arranging some chrysanthemums. And it is possible that these are chrysanthemums that were grown by Carol because she was a market gardener. And there is a, um, an area of research that could go into women who do flower arranging having access to gardens where they can grow the flowers that they bring to the church, or women who are reliant on using wildflowers, or women that have to buy cheap flowers from supermarkets. It's quite a cost-heavy activity. And here we have the pulpit at St Stephen's and what appear to be daffodils, apple blossom and some shrubbery. And so the, these are things that are fairly easy to come by in the Borsuch countryside. <coughs> Five years before Doris and Grace did the flowers in 1955, the book Fun with Flowers by Julia Clements was published. In the Telegraph obituary of her death, in 2010, she was described as having been responsible for introducing two million women worldwide to the art of flower arranging. A prolific writer, she was described as the head of a vast salvation army in which souls are saved through the medium of flowers. Her work was based on the belief that after the Second World War had deprived women of any outlet for creativity and she toured the country giving flower arranging demonstrations. <clears throat> and she gave a lot of practical advice and training information, did a lot of writing about setting up flower clubs. And in fact, as a result of her work, in 1959, the National Association of Flower Arrangement Societies was formed. And this slide shows the flower arranger, which is the <coughs> quarterly magazine produced by NAFAS. These publications provide practical information, particularly for church flower arrangers. And this is a, an image from the NAFAS Guide to Church Flowers, published in 1967. Bit of material culture there for you. Um, and these are the different types of vases that a church flower arranging group would expect to have. They had information on the mechanics, how to put together quite complicated things, quite similar to some of the stuff that was being advocated for by Cutts in the 19th century. And here we have the archetypal, what we think of as a church flower arrangement. Um, interesting point, apparently Constance Spry invented the pedestal that was used in this way before it had been big vases rather than pedestals. So at this point, it's clear that the notion of flowers as fripperies is no longer relevant. 
Lots of flowers, lots of different types of colours, massed together in complete defiance of the Bishop of London's ruling. So by the time that Doris and Grace are arranging flowers in 55, the impetus for doing so is presented as springing from female creativity and artistic impulse. However, that creativity is as regulated as it previously has been. When we look at the pedestal arrangement, we see the form, a triangular shape which conforms exactly with Clement's design principles. It's a very typical nafas arrangement and you can walk into any church in this country and you will find something that is that shape. By producing standard training manuals and running flower arranging competition, NAFAS encouraged conformity of shape and use of flowers. Training materials described arrangements in detail, giving the numbers, quantities and placements of flowers to be used as though they were cake recipes. Now, given the apparent lack of new and young flower arrangers on the rota, it's reasonable to assume that the arrangements in St Stephen's haven't changed very much. I would therefore argue that flower arranging in St Stephen's does not offer real opportunities for creativity for the women of Ambridge. It offers communal, mm, communal acceptance and stability. I just want to finish with this, which was actually produced by um, professional florists at a workshop, but I'd like to think that if Fallon did flowers, <laughs> they'd look like this. Thank you. I absolutely love that, particularly the intersection between kind of social class and the aesthetic. I think it's really inter and gender. Yeah, amazing. And I know Abby, you have to say something since you see a lot of judges. Well, I was just going to say, um, so I'm the person who's presenting um, tomorrow about um, funerals. I'm a funeral director, oh. and I go into churches an awful lot. And sweet. I can assure you that you always see things like that, and you never see anything like <laughs> it. So that is absolutely correct. <laughs> So, uh, any questions? I, uh, poor old Grace Archer. So there she is on the rotor at 25 with her mother-in-law. No wonder she burnt herself to death. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Yep. Hey, uh, um, I just wanted to let you know that um, when Sarah Jane Smith was married, appears once on the rotor as well, shortly after getting married. So. Hello. Let's have a question and a couple of comments. Um, we are currently in the process of arranging a flower festival in our church, in which all the individual groups in the church are choosing an event post World War II and doing the arrangements themselves. Our flower arrangers, sadly all widowed or married ladies still <laughs> are deeply threatened. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. And uh, I have to thank you as well because we in Bellringers are have an inordinately large number of Archers fans. Yay. Um, Yay. We're thinking of doing the Archers for our display from the Bellringers and you've just been oh, using yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I have worked occasionally as a wedding florist, and the first thing I learned, and it was quite a hard lesson to learn, was you always check out the flower ladies, because if they don't like what you're doing, because you're, you're on their territory, you know, you're using their overused um, floral foam. So you really have to be quite careful. The first, the first wedding I ever did, which was for a friend, it, was, it wasn't a professional job, we used um, big allium globes. We had them sort of lining the altar, and it was a little church in a village in Cambridgeshire. And one of the church ladies came up to me and she went, hmm, it's very modern, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're fearsome. Yeah, well, yeah. If anyone was struggling with the definition of heteronormative, it's something to do with this, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was just going to. 
to add to your story about being told you were modern. <laughs> when I grew up in small village, um, we had a children's club, and each of the parents took in turns to teach us something each week. We had a flower arranging with one of the ladies in the flower arranging at the church. And I did something which I thought looked look good, and she pulled it out completely. <laughs> That is not how you do it, that's not how it's done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then, more recently, the last 10, 20 years, what I was doing then is what is now really fashionable. I'm like, where is Mrs. Marks? I've just been added to the flower up to the flower Which is so cute, it actually uses the model for the whole new railway shirt. I'm terrible, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I've only on it once this year. I think I'm just going to let you have one go. So I'll have to think more carefully about it. Thanks.